Hi there, I'm David Aldous and welcome once again to In Depth. David Pawson joins me again this week as we continue to look at the teaching of Revelation and David's book, When Jesus Returns. David, welcome once again. Let's start with a brief summary. Now, we've been seeing that Revelation is in three parts. Now, we've looked at the first two parts. We now come on to the good news of the third part. Well, it begins with Jesus' return. Uh, but he's coming back for two purposes. One is his wedding and the other is a battle. The wedding, he's going to be married. I was once in a, child, a children's school and children were asking questions and one boy said, why wasn't Jesus married? And I said, it's all right, he's going to be. And afterwards, the headmaster in his office said, what's this about Jesus getting married? I said, haven't you read the last book in the Bible? You see, the Bible is a romance. It's the story of a father looking for a bride for his son. God the Father looking for a bride for his son, Jesus Christ. And the bride is us. And there's got to be a wedding. Every romance ends with a wedding and they live happily ever after. He's coming back for his marriage to us. We are his bride. We're at the moment engaged to Christ. That's how Paul puts it. We're betrothed to Christ. We're engaged to be married. And an engagement can break. But one day we will be married and that's the day he's coming back for. But he's also coming back for a big battle. It's called a battle of Armageddon. Uh, that's a Hebrew word, Ha-Megeddon, which means the hill of Megiddo, which is a little town in the middle of a triangular plain surrounded by Judean hills called Megiddo. You can go there today. It's the crossroads of the world. The road from Arabia to Europe crosses the road from Asia to Africa at Megiddo. So wherever you go in the world, you've got to go past Megiddo. And that's the scene of the last but one battle of history. And it says a huge army will have gathered, led by the Antichrist and the false prophet, to get rid of Jesus and his followers. It's got to be a huge army because uh, by this time Jesus is not just with 12 disciples, he's with hundreds of thousands who've gathered with him there. And so this great army is there. It's called a battle, but it isn't a battle at all. With one word, Jesus kills the lot of them. And the idea of Jesus as a, as a mass killer is a new thing thought to many people, but one of the first things he'll do when he gets back is to destroy that army and leave the field of Armageddon so thick with corpses that nobody could bury them all. And an angel calls the birds of the air to come and pick the corpses clean. It's an incredible picture, but this is in Revelation 20 uh, and it will all happen. But that's the battle of Armageddon. There's no fighting really. Jesus, just as he killed a fig tree with a word when he was here on earth, will kill the whole army with a word. But that's a Jesus that isn't meek and mild. Who is this army made up of, David? It's made up of ordinary people who have followed the Antichrist and the false prophet, who are his conscript soldiers who want to serve him, who've enlisted or been conscripted, and they are simply out to destroy Jesus and the Christians. Do they know they're out to destroy Jesus? Of course they do. That's what they're going for. Um, get so rid what of I'm, him. What I'm trying to say is what are you trying to say? <clears throat> that they're not hoodwinked. These people that are joining Satan's army are they're, not hoodwinked into believing something else. They will believe that Jesus is coming to destroy, that he's coming to end their life, that he's coming to spoil things, to put it simply, uh, which is the old lie of the devil ever since the Garden of Eden. Um, but that battle is soon over. Now that has left this huge vacuum. The army is gone. Its two leaders have been thrown into the lake of fire. That's when Jesus takes over for a thousand years. Now we all know the word millennium now. Used to be only heard in church, but now it's heard everywhere outside church and never inside apparently. But it refers to Revelation 20 where six times God says a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. And the last two he says the thousand years, the thousand years. And that's raised this whole question of the millennium, the millennium. Not just the year 2000, but this thousand years that is mentioned six times in this single passage. And an awful lot of controversy has come about that. I'm sure you've heard of a millennial, pre millennial, and post millennial. 
friend of mine was asked whether he was a pre or post millennium, and he said, that is a pre posterous question. And a lot of modern Christians duck the issue altogether and just say, I'm pan-millennial, meaning everything will pan out all right in the end anyway. But that's ducking the scripture. Here is God telling us six different times mm. about a period of a thousand years. Even if that figure is symbolic, it refers to a length of time, a long period of time. Mm. So what happens during that time? And the answer clearly is that the saints are reigning with Jesus on earth. They are the government now. Christians who have prepared for that in their daily work are now taking over the world in the name of Jesus. And uh, the world will finally be seen to what it can be like under good government. Mm -hmm. It's as if God doesn't want to destroy this world until he's shown us what it could have been like. A final demonstration of his rule, his kingdom, his reign on earth through his son Jesus. Now the Bible is packed with promises of what can happen to this old earth under the right sort of government. It says that health will improve so much that anybody dying at a hundred will be regarded as tragically premature. It means that we go back to the length of life there was in the days before Noah's flood when Methuselah lived 960 odd years, that life will be healthier, longer. It says that life will be safer. It talks about children playing in the streets again and old people walking the streets of the city without fear. Can you imagine that? We, 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 let's just clear this up. We're talking now about the people who have not been caught up. We're, not, we're talking here about the people that aren't the saints, aren't we? Oh yes, because who are, who are Christians going to reign over? Yeah. Uh, there will still be lots of other people. It's only the army that is destroyed at Ar Armageddon. Every man jack of the army will die. So but these there are people still now, people all over the world of all nations. What about their salvation now from this time on? I've no idea. And what the Bible doesn't tell me, I never dare to say. Mm. There's silence there. We'll say a little more about it in a few minutes but there will still be loads of people around and Christians will be the government and will be running in charge of ten cities or whatever. And not only will health improve and longer life, there will be peace on earth. And uh, that's very simple. There's a simple reason for that. Why is there not peace? Because there's not justice. And as long as there is injustice, there won't be peace anywhere. And this is the real problem in the world. Who settles disputes and will they be accepted as just? I must tell you, David, I went to the United Nations headquarters in uh, New York and there were two things I wanted to see. One outside <coughs> the entrance in a big lawn is a huge lump of granite and on it is half a verse of the Bible. It's always dangerous to quote a half a verse or even a whole verse out of context, but there's half a verse. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now that's, that's a quote from two prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah and Micah. They both said the same thing. And the United Nations hopes that that's going to happen through the work of the United Nations. It never will. Mm. But they hope that one day multilateral disarmament will be a fact. But you and I know it's not going to be. But the Bible says it will be on earth. But the first half of the verse says why. It says that when the Lord reigns in Zion, he will settle the disputes between the nations and they will beat their swords into plowshares because Jesus will settle disputes, international disputes, with justice. And when he settles them, people will say, that's right. That's fair. That's just. And they will not need to fight anymore. Can you imagine a world in which all the money that's spent on bombs and tanks and planes, bombers, is spent on food and clothes and education? <clears throat> that world is coming. It's not a pipe dream. It's promised by God in the Bible. So many things are promised. Well, that was one thing I wanted to see in the United Nations and I wanted to see something else. And we had a two-hour tour and a little girl in blue uniform finally said, well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our tour. Have a nice day. And I said, but you haven't shown us one room. We'd seen the General Assembly room, the Security Council room, 
But I said, you haven't shown us one room. She said, what room is that? And I told her. And she said, no, that's not open to the public. It's locked. I said, but I want to see it. And she said, well, I'm sorry, I can't show it. I said, but I've come a long way to see it. And she said, well, I'm sorry, you can't see it. Then I played my trump card. I said, I've come all the way from little old England to see it. That usually gets the Americans right here, you know? And so she said, go to one of the guards in the foyer and he might let you in. So I went to this big man with a couple of pistols in a holster. And I said, could you show me this room? No, he said, it's not open to the public. I said, but uh, I'd like to see it. Oh, well, he said, no, it's, it's uh, locked up. I said, but I've come all the way from little old England to see it. And he gave way too. And he said, how long do you want to be in there? I said, two minutes. And uh, he said, he got the key. And he took me across the foyer, opened the door and showed me in. It's a room with no windows. It's the prayer room of the United Nations. And in the middle of the room is the God they pray to for world peace. There's a circle of prayer mats and prayer stools all around. And in the middle is what I can only describe as a big black block. I think it's of iron or something. And it's up on a pedestal and all the prayer mats face this big black block which is supposed to represent all the gods of the world. And it's painted matte black and you look into this, it's a bit like this set, and you kind of look into the black and you're supposed to imagine your God in there. And I thought, I've seen the God of the United Nations. And I thought half a verse of the Bible outside and a big black block they pray to inside, hopeless. But the Bible promises that one day when the Lord reigns in Zion, he will settle the disputes among the nations and they will multilateral disarmament. It has been said mm. in various circles that the United Nations, of course, is the beginning of the world, the one world government that yes. will be put into place so that yes. the Antichrist can actually rule. And you know this week there's been a gathering of all the religions of the world in the United Nations in New York to bring it all together. It's mm. happening right now. Anyway, that's another story. Let's get back to the millennium, the millennium. What have we got to look forward to? A world of peace, a world of health, and therefore a world of prosperity when we're not wasting all this money on weapons of destruction. It'll be a wonderful world. Even nature's going to change. It says the wolf will lie down with the lamb so and the lion will eat straw like the ox yeah. and children will play in the forest safely, mm. even with snakes. Now, is all this just poetry? Is it all just imagination? Mm. Or does God mean what he says? I believe that every promise in God's word he will keep. He's kept so many so far. Mm. So here we have a transformed old earth. And you'd have thought that everybody would be thrilled to be in such a world, wouldn't you? Mm. But no. The most extraordinary thing in Revelation 20 is that God releases the devil at the end of the thousand years, allows him back into this world to do what? Within a very short time, he has thousands of people following him, wanting to get rid of this Christian government. Armageddon is not the last battle of history. There's another one. And we find at the end of a thousand years of peace, prosperity, health, happiness, we find thousands marching with the devil to get rid of the Lord and his government. Why? Now, this is the big question. It's huge. <laughs> but it's a very simple answer <clears throat> because they don't want it. Yeah, but why? Because there has been censorship. There has been nothing on television that Jesus couldn't watch. There's been nothing published that Jesus couldn't read. There's been nothing allowed that can't have the approval of Jesus. And people hate that. And the devil comes with the original temptation that he tempted Adam and Eve with and says, you don't want to be under this government. They're restrictive. They don't let you enjoy yourself. But that They're only happens your when he comes back, surely. Yeah. When, when Satan is released, I mean, the people haven't got any influence to be tempted under. So therefore, they're not going to feel that way, surely. They will feel that way. <clears throat> when you're told that you can't do what you want, you see, the government during the thousand years won't be a democracy. There'll be no debates. It will be a benevolent dictatorship, for want of a better word. Jesus will make the laws and we will apply them. And people don't like that. When they want to 
do what they want. They don't like to be told not to. It's the initial reaction. Go and see what Johnny's doing and tell him to stop, was a mother. A little girl, a little boy went to school and the teacher said, what's your name? And he said, uh, my name is Johnny Don't. And they, no, surely that's not, well, that's what mummy always calls me. Johnny Don't, you see. And people see God as a thou shalt not God. You don't do this, you don't do that. He's there to spoil our fun, isn't he? He's there to stop us doing what we want to do. And this is reaction, you see, finally, God is proving to people that sin has nothing to do with the environment. That's the humanist lie, yeah. that it's a bad environment <coughs> that produces <coughs> crime and sin. It's nothing of the kind. It's a rebellion inside our human hearts that is sin. And here we have a thousand years of peace, prosperity, health, all that we said we wanted. And people are ready to believe the lie of Satan. You'd be better off without this government. Don't let him tell you what not to do. Don't let him tell you not to take the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Do you see? Mm. It's the same old thing. And it proves once and for all that sin is something that comes out of us. It's not put into us. It's a rebellion that wants to do it my way and not his, that doesn't want him telling me how to behave and how to live. Are the, are the inhabitants of the earth, initially, after this has happened, are they going to be happy about the rule of God, the rule of Christ? I think they'll have very mixed feelings. They'll welcome some of the fruits of it, obviously, welcome world peace, but they will not like being told what they can't do. There's a rebellious streak in us against authority. As you know, we live in a society now that hates authority, that is rebellious against anybody else being in authority over me, telling me what to do. And ultimately, of course, that's sin that says, God, I won't have you telling me what to do and what not to do. And so finally, God has demonstrated on this old earth <coughs> what this world and what life can be like under his rule in his kingdom. But he's also demonstrated that people still don't want it. So what is he to do now? There's only one thing to do to hold the day of judgment. And that follows immediately. When he divides the human race right down the middle, even families down the middle, between those who want to live under his rule and those who don't. Or to put it in simple language, those who want to live in the kingdom of God and those who don't. And, and we're that's talking again choice. about the people that are obviously left on the earth and we're not talking about the saints here. We're talking about <coughs> everybody now because it says at that point everybody is raised from the dead to face judgment. The Christians have had their resurrection and their new body a thousand years earlier. Everybody else at that point comes to life. It even says, and the sea will give up the dead in it. So all those who went down with the Titanic will come back at that point and many more. And all the dead, great and small, now stand to be judged. Does your life and what you have done on earth reveal that you want to live God's way or that you want to live your own way? And that's when books will be opened, it says. And I, I have the feeling that those books will have a red cover and in gold lettering on, each cover will be, this is your life. And it won't be the nice bits for a half hour program on TV. Do you know that everything I've ever done, thought, said, felt, has been recorded in two places. One place is here. You never forget anything. You may have problems remembering it. And at my age, I begin to have problems remembering things. But you know, I was walking around Newcastle two days ago and going to all my old haunts, all the places I knew in the 1930s, a lot of them have changed. But what astonished me was, time and again, I remembered something that I hadn't thought of for 70 years or 60 odd years. I remembered something else. Do you know, sometimes just a smell can open a whole drawer of memories in your mind and you realize that there is nothing in your life that hasn't been recorded mm. here. You may have difficulty recalling it, but it's all there. But it's also been recorded somewhere else up there and God has kept a record of my whole life. The only things not in that record are what he's forgiven. And then it's wiped out of the record. But you know, if God simply presented me with a book with everything I've done and said, 
even just everything I've said, I'd be damned and I couldn't argue with it. I'd say you're just, Lord, I'm not fit to live in your new universe. I, I belong to an old polluted world, inside as well as outside. But there's another book going to be opened on that day. It's called The Book of Life. And it's a book about Jesus and it's his life. And that's the only book that would pass on that day. The amazing thing is that if I have been faithful to Jesus and stayed with him through thick and thin, my name is in his book and I'm under his name. And I tell you on that last day, that's the book I want to be in. <laughs> Amen. But it's those who overcome who keep their names in that book. And that's the serious thing. Now, beyond all that, we're rushing through the last chapters now, but isn't it good news that there's going to be a day of judgment? Because this life is very unfair. There's a lot of injustice in this world. People, bad people don't get what they deserve and good people don't get what they deserve. All that's going to be put right. There's coming a day when God in his justice, absolutely fair, will give people what they deserve. But that's frightening. I need more than I deserve. I need mercy. But God is going to be absolutely fair. Do you know Hitler will be there? Napoleon will be there? All of them will be there. All the dictators, Nero will be there. Pontius Pilate will stand before Jesus one day. Isn't that a thought? He never realized that when he was judging Jesus. But all of us will stand before Jesus and the basic, the basic principle on which he will judge us is what is our attitude to him? Mm. And when people say, oh, but how could I have an attitude to you? I never met you, I never saw you. He says, what you did to my brothers, you did to me. And his brothers there, I'm quite sure, are those who believed in him. And your attitude to Jesus Christ is revealed in your attitude to those who belong to him. If you laugh at Christians, you're laughing at him. If you ridicule Christians, you're ridiculing him. That's a frightening thought. But that's one of the parables he told about the sheep and the goats. So here we have a day in which finally every human being who's ever lived meets their just deserts. Mm. Or if they've still got their name in his book of life, his mercy sees them through. Mm. And beyond that, now we come to the really good news, a recycled universe. This old earth is not our permanent home. And the Green Movement panics because they think this planet is the only one we'll ever have to live on. That's not the truth. Now Christians share the concern about what's being done to this old earth. It's God's creation. And we are wiping out his species that he created for his enjoyment. Every day we're wiping them out. We're concerned about that, but we're not panicking because this is not the only place we'll ever have to live on. And at the very last bit of the Bible, we have the final chapter in God's story. You know, the Bible is a book of history, but it's different from every other book of history because it starts earlier and it finishes later than any other history book. It starts at the very beginning of our universe and it finishes at the end of it. We have about two minutes left. I'm fascinated We'll have, we'll have to talk in the next talk about this. <laughs> but I'm absolutely right. fascinated by this. We have a new earth and a new space around it, mm. totally new. And a voice from heaven says, behold. And that means, look, be astonished, be surprised. In Welsh, look you. It's, it's, it's an astonishing word saying, just look at this, look at this. Behold, I am making everything new. Not just people, everything new. And the God who made this old planet and the space around us, he's going to make it all over again. So does this happen after the judgment? Yes. So there's this long judgment. I mean, I get a, I get a very vivid picture of a massive great throne and, and queues and queues and mm. myriads yeah. and myriads of people. It's not long at all. What about our judgment? You're meaning as Christians? Yeah. What judgment are we talking about now? Our judgment, if, if well, I'm trying to get it clear in my there are, mind. There are two kinds of judgment that we need to bear in mind. One, the judgment of being allowed to go into that new universe 
or not. Mm. And every one of us faces that on that final day. And if our names are in the book of life, then we're into the new universe. Uh, but you're talking now about another form of judgment, which means is a judgment for purposes of reward. And there is no doubt that those who survive, there will be differences among them of reward. Mm. Some people get a big reward for their faithful service, particularly if they've been faithful to the point of dying for Jesus. And do you know that over a quarter of a million people die for Jesus each year? We've you never... Know. We've never had so many martyrs. We're just about to finish, but I need to say this, uh, the dying yeah. members of this show, that uh, I was at, a, I was at a, a conference, a prophetic conference in Sunderland, mm -hmm. where Mark DuPont stood up and said, 20% of the people in this room will die for their faith. That's a bold prophecy, and time will tell whether he was right. But uh, there are about a quarter of a million I'm just wondering how many people Martyrs would have said, every year. let it be I me. Know. I let it be me. David, bless you. Thank you very, very much indeed once again for a fantastic insight into Revelation. We're going to look more next week. And I hope you have been inspired by what you've been watching as well. If you have, then please do come back next week and watch the final, sadly, in this series of In Depth, when you'll be hearing and seeing David Paulson once again. So until then, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.